All right, it is 5 o'clock. That clock is about 10 minutes slow, so we are going to go ahead and call this uh, City Council workshop for Tuesday, April 17, 2018, to order and let the record show that the entire council is present. And so with that, we are just going to go ahead and start. We're going to start off with our discussion items, uh, DS 13, excuse me, DS 18-031. City manager updates, is that correct? Are we doing that first? Okay. City manager update, introduction of solid waste. Mr. Olson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, we, we proposed a change in the order simply because uh, this is an important topic and I didn't want the council to get tired before you had to think about it. Um, so... <clears throat> I think it was last January, the City Council asked me to prepare a request for proposal to look at uh, bids for uh, privatizing our solid waste functions. As a result of that, we put together a, uh, an RFP that contained several alternatives in it. Uh, the first one is a base bid that is comparable to what the city presently provides in terms of solid waste services. So it deals with uh, a, a base bid that includes um, three cart sizes, uh, the complementary services that the city officer offer, offers in terms of uh, free drop off of a certain amount of uh, uh, solid waste each month, uh, a spring cleanup bulk uh, gathering of solid waste, uh, a, the operation of our transfer station, and the operation of our recycling center. And there might be some other things that I'm forgetting, but, but essentially everything that we're doing now in terms of solid waste was in the base bid. Then we asked for an, al uh, an alternate, a bid alternate number one, which included not three, but one cart size. So a 96-gallon cart size was then uh, part of the proposal in alternate one. Alternate two included a 96-gallon can for solid waste and a 96-gallon can for a curbside recycling program. Um, included in the RFP were provisions that the proposers hire all of our displaced uh, city employee workers relating to the solid waste function, that they purchase our vehicles, that they lease our transfer station and the recycling center. Uh, this RFP went out on the street on February the 12th and the deadline for submittals was uh, March the 16th. Included in the RFP was a scoring criteria where six different criteria were outlined with the number of points that would be given for each one of those criteria. And um, we received four proposals uh, to the RFP. Uh, the whole process was overseen by our purchasing division. Uh, Randy Jimenez is uh, our purchasing um, manager. The committee, after the uh, after the bids were received, we received, as I mentioned, four bids, one from uh, FCC, one from Waste Management, one from Frontier, and one from Texas Disposal. Uh, following receipt of those bids, uh, proposals, I'll probably end up calling them bids, technically they're not, they're proposals. Um, there was a staff committee that reviewed the proposals and ranked them according to the criteria that was in the RFP. The staff committee was comprised of uh, Dennis Baldwin, uh, John Locke, David Olson, and a Amy Berlarley Highland, who is our city engineer. I'm not sure you've met Amy yet, but she's right over here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, slide number three. is a summary of the city's current rates 
for the three cart sizes. So on the graph on the right, what you're looking at there, the red, the red um, part of the bar is the, the base rate for the service. The yellow part are amounts that would shift from solid waste to another function in the city. Uh, were the bid were the uh, proposals to be received. Uh, the pink part would be amounts that could be eliminated. Uh, the green part would be uh, kind of a carryover amount that would have to be added to the proposals that were uh, received from the bidders. And that includes things like uh, the mowing function that we currently have that's paid for out of the solid waste uh, fund. Uh, some portions of the billing and customer service, for example, would carry forward and, and be part of that function as well. And then there's a debt service increment in the rate that needs to be considered. So we have, we have borrowed money to buy equipment and facilities in order to operate this function. And that debt doesn't go away, so it needed, needs to be considered as well. <clears throat> so the red part, that's how, that's how our rates are composed um, here in the city. Now if you go to slide number four, this is a little bit more detail on the shifting costs that we've um, calculated, the, the city costs. So part of those... The yellow part that you see on that uh, pie graph, the $2.92 of the rate would have to shift somewhere else in the, in the city. And on the right, you see a table there where it says general fund, 1.1 million, and water fund, 400,000, and drainage, just short of uh, 50,000. Those are the amounts that would shift to the different funds. The green part is the carry forward. This is an amount that would be, have to be added to the base proposals from each of the four bidders uh, in order to uh, make sure that our business was still taken care of. And the pink part could be eliminated from the bill. So you can see already, this is a, this is a it's not as easy as just comparing one number with the next. It's taken a great deal of effort on the, on the part of the staff to, uh, to make sure that this is fair and that it has been calculated appropriately. Let's go to the next, next number five. So what you're looking at on this slide is the results of the rating. So each of the four raters independently and separately rated the proposals. And then they came together and they basically added each score from the four raters together to get these, these composite scores. Uh, there were 800 points possible, and I could break that down for you if you're interested. I'm not gonna cover it at this moment in time. The ranking results were that FCC Environmental came out as the number one proposer, Waste Management number two, Frontier Waste Solutions as number three, and Texas Disposal as number four. And you can see the point spread there um, for yourself. <clears throat> now we're gonna give a little bit of detail on each of, the, each of the four proposing companies and their proposals. So if you look at slide number six, I'm gonna go through the pros and the cons uh, that the evaluators saw on each one of the proposals. FCC is, first of all, the only, and it doesn't say that here, I'm just going to tell you, FCC is the only one of the four proposers that met all of the criteria in the RFP. The other three were, uh, were short of meeting the criteria in, in one or more uh, categories. So... FCC has been in operation since 1911. They provide solid waste services internationally. They have current contracts in uh, Rowlett, Texas, Orange County, Florida, and Polk County, Florida. They, their residential base bid 
was lower than the city's uh, on, on build, bid alternate number one, which is the 96 gallon container only. Uh, their commercial prices are lower than the city rates. They do intend to hire all of the displaced city employees. They will purchase the existing vehicles and containers. They will lease the transfer station and the recycle center. They have customer service available uh, Monday through Friday from 8 to 5 and on Saturday from 8 uh, to 2 o'clock. The cons of their proposal is that uh, their residential base bid was higher than the city for the third, 32 and the 64 gallon containers. And you can look at this one way or another. We listed it as a con the fact that this company is based out of Spain. It's an international company without um, United States headquarters. The next slide uh, is uh, the second, the second rank proposer, which is waste management. The pros that that we have identified are that this company has been in business for 50 years. They have current contracts um, in various Texas cities as well as others throughout the country. Uh, they do intend to hire all of the displaced city employees based on their qualification requirements. And they will purchase all of the city's containers. They have customer service that will be available Monday through Friday from 7.30 to 5 and on Saturdays from 8 to noon. And they have an online customer service um, connection that would be a 24-7 have 24-7 access. The cons on, on this proposal is that they did not submit a base bid uh, proposal for the three cart sizes. Uh, they will only provide service through a 96-gallon container. Their commercial rates are higher than the city. They will purchase some, but not all, of the city's vehicles. They'll purchase 24 out of 72 vehicles. They will not lease the transfer station, but they will operate it and charge the city $51.32 a ton uh, to operate it. And that, we don't know for sure, but that may impact the 300 pound free disposal for residents. And they will not operate the recycle center. Slide number eight is Frontier Waste Solutions. The pros are that their base bid prices are lower than the city rates. Their commercial prices are lower than the city rates. They will purchase all of the vehicles and the containers. They do intend to hire all the qualified displaced city employees. And um, they will lease the transfer station and the recycle center. They have customer service available Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. The cons on this uh, proposal. Can we, uh, do we want to take questions now or you want to? I got a question pertaining when he said. Oh, okay, go ahead, Mr. Employees. Mr. Rivera. Yes. I need to find out. What well, I think that's, that. that's going to be similar to uh, waste management's proposal if if the company's criteria are met, they'll hire them, and if they're not met, they won't. The, the cons is that this company was founded in February of 2017. In other words, they're, they're a new company. Um, they don't have long-term experience as a company and they have no comparable municipal clients. Um, their overall uh, proposal was brief. It did not provide sufficient detail or evidence or uh, information to demonstrate their ability to perform. And uh, 
the references that were included in their proposal for, were for the individual uh, people in the company. A and the references were for those individuals when they worked for other companies, which you would naturally understand with a new startup company. <clears throat> on on uh, slide number nine, the Texas Disposal Systems, the pros were that they were founded in 1977. They are based in Texas. They have contracts, long-term contracts, with Austin, San Antonio, um, and uh, Georgetown, San Marcos, Kyle, and Alpine, Texas. That is not to say that they do all of the collection for the large cities, but they do a portion of it. Um, they will purchase all of the vehicles and containers. They will lease the transfer station. And they have customer service available Monday through Friday from 7.30 to 5.30 and on Saturday from 8 to 2. The cons uh, of this proposal are that their base bid rates are higher than city rates. Their commercial rates are higher than the city rates. They do not intend to hire all of the displaced city workers, and they will not operate the recycle center. If we go on to um, uh, slide number 10, this is going to be a little bit more in-depth analysis of the, uh, of the various bids, the next several pages. So, uh, on slide number 10, what you're looking at are the city's costs on the, on the left, and then in order of their rank, FCC, uh, Waste Management, Frontier, and TDS um, as they go across. The red portion of the, uh, what would you call that? Bar, yes. The red portion of the bar is their base bid. Uh, the green portion would be the carryover that we would need to add on to their bid, and the blue portion is the amount of debt service we would need to add on to their bid. Now, you'll see that that blue, that blue piece varies in size, and the reason it varies in size is that each one of the proposers proposed different, different amounts of money for the city's equipment. So... If they proposed a lot, like uh, Frontier, their proposal would be sufficient for us to pay off all the debt, so there's nothing additional we would need to add on to it. You take another one, uh, they, they proposed a par an amount that would pay off a partial amount of the debt, and so we would need to add on something to continue to pay the debt that would be left over. And then I will note the yellow part again. That is the shifting part. If the, the yellow part of the uh, city's amount, uh, which, which, by the way, is about $1.6 million a year, those amounts would need to shift uh, to other funds, the general fund, the water and sewer fund, and the uh, drainage fund primarily. And we're going to go to page number 11 which is the same kind of a comparison for the 64-gallon cart. I'll give you just a moment to look at that. I'm not going to explain it any further because it's, it's the same explanation for this one, just different numbers. And then if you go to page number 12, it, same comparison for the 96-gallon cart. And then page 13 is the total. So. We were looking for a way to compare the base bids across the board. So we have a certain, we have a certain number of 32-gallon carts. In fact, you can see it there. We have, we have 832 customers that use a 32-gallon cart. We have 3,542 customers that use a 64-gallon cart and 44,473 customers that use a 96-gallon cart. So we took that customer base times the uh, proposals to come up with a total monthly revenue stream so that we could compare the base bid across uh, 
uh, across the proposers. <clears throat> and I'll just give you a moment. You can see that the city, the city's total, well, let me, let me back up for just a moment. The, the blue part down at the bottom of the screen are, represents the 32-gallon uh, carts. The yellow part represents the 64-gallon carts, and the red part represents the 96-gallon carts. The total monthly revenue that would come off of those proposals is across the top of the red bar. The, this chart does not account for the shifted costs. You need to keep that in mind. Um, <clears throat> number 14 is bid alternate number one. This, this proposal takes into consideration a single 96-gallon cart. Now, there are some efficiencies to having one cart over three carts. And you'll see that the, the, bit, the proposals are a little bit different. In terms of the city's portion, that is a calculated number. Okay, we don't do it. We don't do a single 96-gallon cart. We do a combined three, three size carts. But we have calculated, we have extrapolated, calculated from that what the city's cost would be if we had one cart only. So that comparable cost is a calculated cost, and you can see how that that compares across the spectrum. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Olson, do we know of those roughly 4,000 or so citizens who have the uh, 32 and, and 64 carts, do we know are those primarily in uh, elderly fixed income or do we know who those people are? We do. I, I can't say right now, but we do know that. We know where they are. We know who gets it, who uses them. And, um, and, and by the way, we do have an additional service, and it was part of the proposal that if somebody wants an additional service where our, the employees would go up and actually get the cart out of the garage and bring it down and then take it back, we have that service available today, and that was part of the proposal as well. There is an, I think there's an extra fee that is attached to that. Is that correct? It's a need-based service. Sorry? It's a need-based service. If there's a administrative need, we provide a charge. That might be more answer than you asked for. No, no. It, 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 I, I thank you for that because um, the, the, the way I see it on a, on a single 96-cart service, um, it is definitely for uh, for 4,000 citizens. It's a rate increase, period. And, and it's a rate decrease for 44,000. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mrs. Fleming. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have one question, uh, Mr. Olson. Uh, on this, uh, those 64 gallons, what Mr. Uh, Kilpatrick was referring to the, uh, and David said it was like a need assessment. Do you know at this time how many medically people that really need that service and how much the cost is right now? We, we have that number. Let's see if anybody here remembers it. 2,000. 2,000. 200. 200. Thank you. Thank and you, it, Mr. And, and he said it was free. Or the it's, service it's to pick up the... It doesn't cost anything. It doesn't cost anything as long as they got medical. Okay. Right. I just needed to know that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Continue on. Okay, so are we ready to move on? Ready. Continue. Right, so, so slide number 15 is bid alternate number two, <coughs> which is refuse collection and curbside recycling with two 96-gallon cans. The refuse can would be picked up every week. The recycling can, canister, container, would be picked up every other week. So you can see how those bids uh, compare across the spectrum. And on this one, the city's number is an estimated number. 
So we have actual numbers on the base bid, we have calculated numbers on the 96 gallon can, and we have estimated numbers on, on the recycling. We think the numbers are good, but there's some things there that if, if we, if the council decided to move in that direction, we would need to verify some of our numbers. I'm ready to go to number 16. <clears throat> this is a comparison of commercial rates. You'll notice that there's no overhead or shifting, shifting costs on these, and that's because in nearly every case, the proposers would establish a direct relationship with the customer. They would do the billing. There would not be a billing overhead or a customer service overhead that the city would have to deal with. So these, these are easy comparisons, and, um, well, I misspeak. They are not easy, and the, and the reason they're not easy is because there are so many choices for a commercial, uh, a commercial uh, enterprise to pick from. They can pick from a multitude of different size containers, and they can pick from a, an entire variety of how many times they get it picked up, from once a week to once, once a month. So when you, look at, when you look at that whole commercial operation, there's, it, it is so difficult to uh, make apples to apples comparisons. So what we did was looked at our current service requirements and, and just simply took the Propose uh, the proposer, proposals from the the, uh, the different companies and applied it to what we're doing today, and I think that's about as good a comparison across the the uh, four proposals that we we can get. Let's go to number 17, please. So we're going to move forward, and I think there are some things the council needs to keep in mind as you evaluate the proposals in more detail. First of all, for all practical purposes, this decision is going to be a, a, a permanent change. Uh, now, in saying that, I know very well that there are some cities that went, went to the, uh, privatized their operations and then went back to a municipal operation. But after you've sold all of your equipment, after you have transferred all of your employees off to a private company, the opportunity to come back and restart all of that for all practical purposes is nearly impossible to do. So as you make your decision, you should keep in mind that, that this is a serious decision and it's very likely a permanent one once you make it. Customer service is always a concern. You need to be satisfied that uh, the customer, the city cannot shed customer service. We can contract the, serv the service out. We can contract the collection. But at the end of the day, um, as good a job as a company may do, um, we still own a portion of that, of that customer service. Uh, rate control is another issue. With each of the proposals, there is a base bid for the first year, and there is an escalator clause included for years following that. That, es that escalator ca clause will would be based on the refuse rate index, which is a specific uh, inflationary index for solid waste functions. It also includes consideration for um, a fuel uh, surcharge if, if uh, petroleum products go uh, out of sight. <clears throat> and at the current time, that refuse rate index is running about 2.5% a year. And I think you can pretty much count on, uh, once you make the decision, the, the contract will take over and you can pretty much count on an escalator happening every year. And, and that's something that they handle at their level. They're not gonna come back to the council like we do now. Right now the council makes that choice, but Correct. if we do that to them, it's... it's just... Council gets to evaluate it and set the rates every year. Once we've adopted the contract, we will follow the contract. Follow the contract. 
Um, there are budget impacts, and again, I will reference the shifted costs. We need to consider that because the decision you make is going to have an impact on, on the general fund, the water and sewer fund, and the drainage fund, and perhaps some others too, some of the internal service funds. This is Nash Clean. Um, are you saying that once if someone else take over, we lose the capital of the city, we lose all control? As far as price, you know, if you do that escalation clause, which is in the contract, fuel surcharge, so prices will go up. We have, you know, no control over that because it's in the contract. Your, your control is in adopting the contract. Yeah. So once right, you've adopt, you've exercised your control by adopting the contract. But once you've done that, the contract will take over, and we will follow the provisions of the contract. I would rec I would kind of compare it to our cellular phone bills. You know, we sign a contract, and every once in a while, you see an extra five dollar charge there because they're they're going to adopt. They're not going to go down. You know, and decide what I didn't agree to that five dollars, but it's tacked down there. So you know. So all the complaints will go to if we decide. I think we'll still get the complaints because <laughs> citizens look at us as the leader. Like our city manager said, you know, we're still going to have that customer service tied to us, even though we put it out. Most of us are going to come to us. The final consideration that I would mention to you is that in the proposals, there were, I believe, seven unsolicited uh, variations uh, of offers. Uh, the most um, I don't know what the right words are. My, my language is failing me. Pardon me? Notable. Notable, thank you. The most notable of those uh, offers were 15-year proposals. The, the RFP that we put out was for a five-year proposal. So we got a couple back with 15-year alternative proposals. Now, obviously, these companies are going to be investing money on the front end. They're going to buy our equipment. They're going to buy our carts. They're going to, you know, replace them with their own carts. So there's, there's a capital outlay on the front end for them. And the longer that they can am amortize those costs over more years, the better rates that they'll be able to give us. Now, we didn't ask for 15 years. We asked for five years. So as we've looked at it, what, what we think as a staff is that after the council looks at it, if you decide that a 15-year term is a better term, I think what we should do and what I recommend to you is that we restructure an RFP and go out and ask for a 15-year term so that all proposers have an equal uh, playing field to make their proposals on. Let's go to the final slide, number 18. Um, so the next steps. The council needs to review the proposals and the documentation uh, to your own satisfaction. Um, you need to prepare whatever additional comments and questions you may have. We'd like to set a special workshop for next week where we start to delve into the more detail and, and your more detailed questions. Um, you need to keep in mind that this is a controlled process. The proposals that we've received are still confidential. They are proprietary to the companies, and we're gonna honor that. We'd like to honor that. They are confidential until the process is concluded. Once the process is concluded, then they're public records and everybody can have a copy if they want to. And inside of the proposals, there is an anti-lobbying provision that continues in effect until the city council makes its decision. So if any of the proposing companies have additional questions or comments or want additional, uh, the opportunity to make additional clarifications, they need to, as, as outlined in the RFP, they need to contact our purchasing division and make those comments to uh, Sophonia Price. Now, Randy Jimenez has done a great job, and he, he is leaving us. He's done so good, he's got someplace else to go. So, uh, Sophonia Price uh, will be the person who, who uh, will take, take the calls. And if the council has any questions as you go through it, you're welcome to call, you're, again, you're, you're welcome to call Sophonia or you're welcome to talk to, my, uh, to me. And, and so, and so I, copies of the 
you have you have the summary. You have. Um, I think we have a copy of the RFP ready to give them, right? Okay, so on your desk you have a copy uh, of the request for proposal and the, the bid documents are available at City Hall for you to look at. Now, we did not copy them because they're about that thick, and, but you're welcome to look at them. Uh, council has an office at City Hall. You're welcome to go in there, pour through them to your heart's content. And I just, I just wanted to say, Mr. City Manager, because before we get too deep into this, uh, what we wanted to do today was kind of present that to you guys, council members, so and give you that time to look at. We didn't get, want to get too deep into the discussion until next week because we haven't really had an opportunity. And I know that some council members, uh, they want th that ample time to dig in. And so what we did, we wanted to do this as a presentation. And part of that, we didn't put that... I don't think we posted it on the website, the presentation, so that we, you, you're the first one to get that today so that you can digest it. And then next week, come back with your answers. And I just want to point that out because I know you guys are probably digging to get into it. But if you got basic questions, please, you know, let's just stay on that line. And then next week, let's jump into it and do that. Mr. Johnson. Just two basic questions on page five of your slide. Could you provide by email the scoring criteria and also the individual scores uh, for each section? I think you said there was four. If you don't have that today, you can just email it. Do we have a copy? Do we have it? And then just, just a comment. Um, I'm going to take time and read. I will stop by City Hall and read by all means, those, yeah. uh, those docs. Um, I will say that um, for me as an individual council member, it's going to be important that I get citizen input prior to the 24th. So I have to figure out a way uh, without violating anything, but also getting their input. And so we'll see how that works out. And, and maybe, I, I don't know how that's going to work for you, but maybe we need to go through the process and before a final decision is made, we need to have some, some process for public input to that as well. In fact, we have, a, we have a, uh, a lady that wants to make a comment today on a portion of this. She's, she's actually wanted to make a comment on solid waste and recycling for a long time, and this is the, kind of the perfect opportunity. So she, she called in weeks ago and asked for this opportunity. And, well, and I'm, 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 I'm fine with that. I just want the citizens to have an opportunity to where it's very informal, not a public hearing where you know, they only get three minutes. I, I really want it to be more of a town hall style. Uh, so we can go through everything with them and, 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 and answer their questions as well because I won't vote on this until I have their full input. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's good, but it, it, you know, we got to figure out how to overcome that challenge because so much information, uh, if you just see it out on the outskirts, you know what this is, uh, you can't make a good decision. You have to go in it deep, and that's where we have to figure out how to do that, especially with our citizens. And so, Mr. Harris? Um, yes, I'd just like to say that um, you know, I concur with the Councilman uh, Johnson there, but at the same time, um, I, I don't think I'll be ready to make any decision until I actually hear from each of the bidders. And the reason I say that is because, you know, as, even as I, look through, <clears throat> as, I look, as I look through the summary here, I see when it talks about employees, I see the word intends, intends, intends. And I know that word intends is not factual. I know that word intends doesn't mean that it will happen. This is what we intend to do, but sometimes, even best in a, based on our, you know, uh, when, we, when we have the best intentions, sometimes we can't do it. So what I need to know is, um, like I said, I want to be able to speak to each bidder. They come in, and we could do it in a closed session, have them come in separately, however we wish to do it. And at the same time, I would like to see, even as we have the uh, scoring criteria, I would like to see, um, if it's not already in here, because I haven't looked at everything yet, but... Um, see basically the breakdown of their scoring, even while they're here, and they can try to explain anything that they see on there, they can, uh, because it's happened before. Uh, they've, seen some, they've seen some errors on there, some things that weren't correct, and I'm not saying anybody did a bad job, but I'm just saying I just want to make sure this is all done good, correctly, and as transparent as possible. Um, so uh, that's, that's definitely one thing I'd like to see, sit, uh, being here with all the bidders, one at a time, or however you wish to set it up, and they explain why prices are higher. They explain what they mean by intend. 
um, like I said, as I, as I read through here, <clears throat> you know, I, like I said, I saw intent. The first one said intent. The second one said intent. The third one said intent is all qualified. And the fourth one said um, we don't intend to hire everybody. I mean, that, I think that was the most honest answer, honestly. But, um, but as far as it goes, I'd want to see that and, of course, the breakdown of the, of, the, of the points as well individually for each bidder. And that's something we can talk about next week when we do the discussion, see if it's a council consensus. Mr. Oakery. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a very brief question. I mean, if we were doing it right now, I'd do this thing right now. I know what to do right now. And the citizens would like it, and I would talk through the bidders. They've already told us what we need to know right here. My question is this, Mr. Olson. When you talks about this shift, can you define what that means? Because I'm, I'm, the way I'm reading it, that you said a shift would, uh, would shift from solid waste to another function. So you mean, and that's, free, that's money that's freed up, right? You don't mean that, or is that a responsibility? Those are, those are um, costs that are currently being borne by the solid waste fund mm -hmm. that cannot be eliminated, so they have to be paid somewhere right. by, by so, someone, some, some operation gotcha. of the city. Okay, that's what I, so it would be one point, whatever that number was. One point, one point six. And the grass cutting in is a good example. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. Mr. Kilpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Bird. I didn't see anything about here about uh, brush pickup. Is that in, in that one of those transfer deals? It's it's part of the base bid. So the city would then would still yes pick up brush every Friday. Uh, that would do it. And any other of the um, you know twice uh, annual. Uh, those those are included in the base. That's bid. That's a shifted cost. Uh, no, sir. That. That's, that's included in the base bid of the companies who made their proposals. So, so they will still so that's a, make... That's a current service that we offer, and we ask them to give us a price that included doing the very same thing. That's the base bid. So we'd have no decrease in what we're offering our services right Correct. now. Correct. Okay. This is Nash King. Thank you, sir. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Olson, can you bring to us the, like, I know you said IT more. What other items do uh, waste management? Shift. What else are we paying? Oh, that's important. All right, Miss Nash King, you done? That was it, Mr. Johnson. Um, this says two in two in one. Is there a whole other slide that we're a presentation that we're missing? This Which is one page, is that? This is page one and two. Is there a whole other? That's it. That's that was it? just a separate. Okay, is, is there where, uh, I asked for the individual scores for each. We'll get them for get you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Herrera. Uh, three things. You gonna put this in the West Eye? I'm sorry? Are you gonna post this in the West Eye? Yeah, now yeah, that it's been, in the yes, West that, eye. that one can be posted. Yes. Now that it's been presented to the council. It, yeah, okay, good. Second. I'll post to the website. When we speak about this, I don't wanna see a closed station on this. Whether we speak out, we need to speak out in the public. And third, if this is the real numbers, and I'm gonna speak for themselves. That's all I gotta say. All right, Mr. Harris. I'll just say this. Um, actually, I can I concur with Councilman Rivera. I mean, I would love to do it in open session, but as you said, we talked about the bids and how it's everything's I guess closed right now until it's all over. That's the only reason I suggested the closed session with us, so we can make a very informed decision. Now, if, if we can do it in open session, let's do it. But if we can't, then that's why I say, let's do it this way, and let's hear from each individual bidder. We're going we're gonna to have to do a legal review on that, make sure that we're on sound, solid ground. And next week, the discussion is in an open session, and it's, that's things we can discuss next week. So, Mr. Oakley. I don't know why we would go back in the closed session or any other session, because it's all public now. Yep. It's only, the only thing that we have that's not is this. But the, like Mr. Rivera says, but the numbers speak for themselves. Yeah, I this agree. Is, yeah. Mrs. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Olson, my suggestion is, okay, all this is out in the open, right? Everyone in Colleen knows that we're going to do this. It's out in the open paper and everything else. Just thinking that 
we have some of the people here tonight, and if any of them have any suggestions or anything that they would like to see, I think the citizens do need to get involved. We need to have an open meeting with the citizens. Let them. We don't need three minutes. We need more than that. And just like a town hall meeting and let them make come out with their questions because this is really going to affect the citizens here in Killeen. Not only this, the city council is going to make the final decision, but the citizens do have a right to speak up on this solid waste. A lot of the employees are afraid they're going to lose their jobs. A lot of them want to come up and speak as well. So I suggest like a town hall meeting and because right now it's going to be a lot of reading on all these, uh, all these um, solid waste companies. So I suggest that we have a town hall meeting, let the people come and voice their opinion, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If, uh, if everybody's done, we did have a citizen, so if we can move on. Were you finished, Mr. Olson, on yes, the presentation? So at this time, we're just going to go ahead and move on to our CP18-001. And Seika Berry, come on up. And you got uh, three minutes. And I don't have a clock, so we'll just estimate. Oh, there it is. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Seika Berry. I live here in Colleen. Um, Council, I did go ahead and pass out or have passed out to you an infographic that I created in regards to what it looks like when we compare Colleen and our recycling to neighboring cities. And you'll notice that Colleen and Harker Heights are the only cities nearby that do not actually have curbside recycling. And that, I think, is a very, very big problem. When it comes to sustainability, we don't have time to consider uh, that this may not be the best decision for city employees. We have to consider all of the people who live in this city. As a former educator in this city, if I failed to meet standard, then I would be held accountable for that. And so it's important that we recognize that, unfortunately, to some extent, the solid waste in our city has failed. In 2016, when this council and several members on this council decided to disband the curbside recycling, you guys contributed to that failure. Mr. Kilpatrick said that at some point, we needed to have a conversation about bringing it back. Today is day zero. I'm a citizen here. My husband teaches here. I taught here, I own a home here. But in order for me to maintain being one of the 832 people in this city who have a 32 gallon trash can, I have to wash my trash, <clears throat> store my trash, and bring it all the way down to the recycling center here in downtown. And I live in Yell Ranch. Why can't I bring it to the transfer station? Well, that's easy. The last time I brought an overflowing car full of papers from my husband's school in order to recycle, I couldn't fit it in the bins. And so I brought it to the uh, transfer station bailing area where I was told by a city employee not to even bother because it was going in the trash anyway. Because in truth, the recycling personnel don't have enough people to get over to the transfer station and do what they need to do. So basically what I'm telling you here today is that whether we recycle, whether we choose to have a curbside recycling program or not, what really needs to happen is we need to kind of look at our selves and look at what we've set as the precedent for our city. As of right now, a department that doesn't work for the citizens in this city, and that's a big problem. So that was just a few of my comments from uh, me sitting down and listening to what you all had to say. And also, of course, I should mention that when I talk to city about officials 30 seconds. who tell me that the problem in our city is the lack of education, I spoke to the KISD Board of Trustees yesterday, and, or uh, last week, I should say, sorry. And one thing I told them was that they need to also educate our students. Because students who educate in schools, or who get educated in schools about recycling, come home and expect their parents to do the same thing. So my closing comment is this. It's never the wrong time to do the right thing, even if it's the most uncomfortable thing to do. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. Appreciate it. And we're going to go ahead and move on. DS 18-032, discuss agenda items for the regular city council meeting of April 24. 2018, first thing on there is our minutes, MN 18-008, consider minutes of regular city council meeting of April 10, 2018. Any questions or comments on those? Seeing none, moving on to resolutions, RS 18-027, consider memorandum resolution approving a professional service agreement with Carver LLC and Bell County for the design evaluation contract administration 
and construction phase service for the security surveillance project on Robert Gray Army Airfield. Welcome, Mr. Van Valkenburg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council, City Manager, City Attorney. Uh, Bell County received a Defense Economic Adjustment Assistance Grant in December 2017 for this project. The city approved an interlocal agreement with Bell County in April of 2018 in which the city would be responsible for the management of the project, including design, construction, and closeout services. This project is fully funded by Bell County and the aforementioned grant. The airport design engineer, Garver, completed a preliminary engineering review for the project, which identified system deficiencies and provided recommended solutions, <coughs> including CCTV, <coughs> monitoring recording equipment, data storage, and other items. The staff has negotiated an agreement with Garver team for the final design of the project. The cost for this is $442,250. There is no financial obligation to the city for any of these funds. We considered alternatives to use this DAG and county funding to design and complete the project or not to design the project with this team. We recommend alternative one. The project is fully funded through the grant and Bell County. There is no financial impact to the city or the Department of Aviation. This is a similar team that was uh, composed of for the ARAC project and the project is fully supported by Fort Hood. Thus, we recommend the City Council why authorize the City Manager to execute a professional service agreement with Garver for the project as well as any and all change orders or supplemental agreements with the amount set by state and local law. And I'll answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Mr. Harris. I see in the, I guess the contract here is in uh, Section 5, 5.1, Instruments of Service, where it says here that says Garver's electronic media are not furnished are furnished without guarantee of compatibility with the owner's software or hardware, and Garber's sole responsibility for the electronic media is to furnish a replacement for the effective disk within 30 days. So, I mean, are, is, there, is their software going to be compatible with ours? It always has been, and it still remains. So I think they're talking about if the disk fails, mm -hmm. that's part of it, they'll do a replacement disk. But for all projects we've had with them, we've had fully compatible software and media. Okay. All right. Thank you. That was, that was my concern. Okay. Yes, thanks. sir. Right. Anybody else? Moving on, RS 18.02A, consider memorandum resolution approving use of a request for proposal for the security surveillance project on Robert Gray Army Airfield, continuation of that. Mr. Van Valkenburg. Thank you uh, very much, sir. For the previously mentioned project, staff is recommending the use of a request for proposal, uh, which has been successful for several uh, airport projects. And this project will provide as we talk about the operational security surveillance system for both airports. The RFP is the right tool. It's qualitative, evaluative. It provides a mechanism to compare various systems. It estimates the system's uh, future capabilities, and it provides the best value for the Army, the city, and the airport. We considered two things. One is to use this RFP to select a system or to use a standard design bid build process. We do recommend alternative one saves time and development costs. There's no, it permits the selection of the most suitable and cost-effective system for both the RGAAF and regional airport. There's no financial impacts against the project. All costs are borne after system selection, and it will provide the best value for both the Army and the city. Thus, we do ask that the City Council authorize staff to utilize the RFP for this system and this process. I'll answer any questions you Questions. All right, seeing none, RS 18.029, consider memorandum resolution approving a lease agreement with CSI Aviation Inc. at the Clean Fort Hood Regional Airport. Mr. Van Valkenburg. Thank you again, sir, as we continue with Aviation Night for Council. Uh, this lease agreement is with CSI Aviation uh, at the Clean Fort Hood Regional Airport. CSI Aviation is a uh, flight operator that provides both scheduled and unscheduled charter services, medical transport, of both personnel and organs, and they are, very importantly here, TRICARE certified, one of the only firms I know, aviation-wise, that is TRICARE certified uh, for these types of services. They also are certified for military charter and transport with the Army. The initial agreement is for a one-year term beginning uh, May 1st, 2018, while we are negotiating a multi-year facility and operational agreement uh, with this company. We are asking for incentives, which is a waiver of the initial six months of rent for this uh, contract. 
We considered not to enter into a lease with CSI. However, we also considered negotiating the lease to establish and diversify aviation business operations at the regional airport. Staff does recommend the second alternative. We've determined that the proposed terms and conditions for the lease are fair and competitive, and CSI will diversify our operations at the airport, bring high paying jobs to the community, add potential economic stimulus to the clean area, add econo economy of the airport, and bring a new and needed aviation service to Central Texas. Thus, we recommend the council approve the lease agreement with CSI, authorize the city manager to execute the same, and execute any and all addendums, including termination, to the extent allowed by city charter and the laws of the state of Texas. I'll answer any questions you may have. Any questions? Mr. Johnson. What is a comment? Great, great job. I think it's good for the airport and our economy. Just two questions. On page one, article three, para, para five, um, is there a deposit? Security deposit, I didn't see one. I, I, I would really like a uh, one month's rent security deposit place in there. Okay. I know it's, it's business, but it's still city property, and just in case they damage anything, including the two office spaces they're leasing. So if we can have a deposit equal to one month's rent, I think that would be great. Um, and then second, on Article 4, Paragraph 1 of the proposed lease, talks about the written consent has to be obtained by the city manager. Is there any way to, uh, to change that to where Matt can have that authority instead of already, instead Departments, of going to the city manager? Authorize yeah. it to the department instead of the city manager? To him, airport aviation. Airport. Sir, that's a question for the city manager and the council. City manager, is that all right? No. No? <laughs> we can certainly delegate that. Council, council should be dealing with me and. Uh, yeah, usually the city manager is the one that signs everything there. So. No, it's not the signing up. When when you look at um, Article Four. Uh, council, that never mind. I'm, I misread it. All right, Mr. Harris, did you have a question? Uh, yes. In Article 6, rentals, fees, and accounting records, um, let's see, it says beginning on in the, the second point there, it says beginning on November 1st, 2018, uh, tenants shall pay airport usage fees in the form of landing fees for aircraft operated by the tenant as described in Exhibit C and says documented, documented air medical mission landings are exempt from the payment of landing fees. Uh, is there, I guess I'll say why is that? We gave them a, uh, a break on the medical portion of that. They don't plan on medical portions for the initial flights here. They're all charter what they have booked right now. We felt that was an added incentive okay. uh, for them for the, for the medical fees okay. uh, for that, for right. the landing fees. Now, the good news about that is most aircraft are under 12.5, 12,500 pounds. Oh. We don't collect landing fees on aircraft under 12,500 pounds. Okay. So. Okay. All right. That explains that. Yes, sir. Um, um, let's see. Next. Um, Let's see, after, <clears throat> after their initial uh, lease term is up, then they get to go month to month. That's correct. Um, what, what kind of, I guess I'll have to ask the question because I'm worried about stability. So what, what kind of plan do they have as, as, as far as the length of time they'll be using the airport? Because if they go month to month, then of course you can just. You know. Yes, sir. The initial term and the month to month are to get us through while we're negotiating the multi-year lease okay. and facility arrangements for them. Uh, at this point, we have engineering drawings from them for a temporary facility that we'll be putting up at the airport, and now we're looking at a long-term facility for them. That's what we're negotiating with them now. This is simply to get us through that, that phase while we do the design and, and, through, and through the uh, final negotiations. Okay. And my, I guess my final question is, uh, you, you made mention about, <clears throat> of course, this, this caught my attention, but you made mention about, you know, higher paying jobs and so forth and things like that. Um, <coughs> What, 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 what type of jobs will they provide that actually, that, I, that will actually pay the, the, high, the higher wages? High paying jobs? Yes. Yes, sir. There are flight, nerves, flight nurses, physician, flight physician assistants, aircraft pilots, aircraft mechanics, and then the administration staff. So whenever you're paying pilots, mechanics, uh, a flight nurse, so a registered nurse and any registered physician assistant or flight physician assistant, 
Those are high-paying jobs. So will those, will those people be, I guess, will they be hired from here or just so they can be hired from anywhere, basically, or? I know that they're local in the area, so they'll be looking for people to hire here okay. to fulfill those positions because this is a new base for them. Here go, they need to hire new people to uh, be part of that base. Okay, all right, thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Oakery. Yes, um, Mr. V, going back to your, um, the portion of the contract that talks about medical in, in, in the amalgamation of, of healthcare in the area, what would they, who would they be supporting? Would they be supporting like Metroplex? Or? Uh, all, all of the hospitals, we have those flights now at the airport that are provided by other providers outside of state. Mm -hmm. So they uh, will provide both the Fort Hood, they've already met with the, uh, the hospital folks at Fort Hood at Darnell. Mm -hmm. So Metroplex, Seton, Darnell, any Scott and White. Uh, right now they have done uh, organ transplant mm -hmm. for Scott and White. They've done those services already from, uh, from this area. So, they're so it's all there, it doesn't matter who it is, but their added benefit is by being TRICARE certified. Now they provide services to a wider uh, base of veterans and military folks that previously wouldn't have had some of that coverage. And so it's not only just for patients, but we talk about organs, uh, life, 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 uh, safety. Yes, sir. What, whatever's, ne whatever's necessary, they are licensed uh, for the full spectrum of transport for, uh, for, for the medical services. Pretty much for you know, for Scott and White, Metroplex, Seton, everyone. All of them. Yes, sir. The, yes, sir. The Army. Yes, Thank sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Van Valkenburg. Thank you, sir. Next is RS 18-030, consider memorandum resolution authorizing the procurement of a red Chinese fire truck. All right, Mr. Mayor Chief Brank. Yep, thank you. <clears throat> Mayor Council, the item on your agenda is a new fire engine. Uh, the Clean Fire Department in 2018, uh, during an emergency assessment, need, a needs assessment determined that we needed, that the, the newest emergency service needs assessment has determined we need a fire engine. In the 2018 budget, we originally delineated ambulances as the appropriate purchase. On January the 3rd, we sent a memo out to the council uh, trying to change the direction. After we evaluated what our needs were, we determined that a fire truck would be a greater need at this time. I did receive a few responses back that said, go ahead, go forward with the fire engine. So that, based on that, we, we moved forward on, on this process. The alternatives that we considered <coughs> was to defer the purchase which would result in a shortage of essential equipment. What that means is, is that if, a fire, if we had more fire engines break down uh, and we didn't have enough engines to put in fire stations, we could end up with a station without a fire engine in it. Uh, we could purchase the ambulances as originally identified in the 2018 budget. We could purchase a fire engine with the original specifications, which would have been much more expensive. Uh, we could assess or rewrite our, our original specifications and focus on functionality uh, and specifically with firefighter safety resulting in the best value. That's what we chose to do. And to put this in context, the fire engine that we're talking about replacing has 144,000 miles on it. It probably doesn't sound like a lot when you compare it to a car, but it also has 2,570 <laughs> pumping hours on it, which would be, if you did the equivalency, that if you drove down the highway at 60 miles an hour, that's an extra 257,000 miles, which would make the equivalent of wear and tear on the truck at about 400,000 miles is what that would make the equivalent at. It does concern, conform to city policy. Uh, Colleen is a member of the Houston Galveston Area Council Purchasing Cooperative, and it is in compliance with the Texas Local Government Code, Section 52022. Satisfies the legal requirements for competitive bids. Each of the vendors supplying quotations participates in the HGAC Cooperative. The action steps that we did to find a fire engine was to convene a panel comprised of firefighters of various ranks. We worked with Fleet Services, uh, the Director of Fleet Services to determine the budget and finance, revised specifications focusing on the functionality <coughs> and safety, and solicited quotations based on the new specifications. The outcome, <coughs> and if you look at these prices, uh, there's also a buy board fee, which is $2,000, which you may have noticed. So. Uh, if there's a discrepancy, the $2,000 is a buy board fee. Uh, the outcome is that Sid and Martin's Pierce, the base price, and these, these are base prices of the fire trucks, and any base price that you look at here will need to add the loose equipment costs in order to make the truck functional. Loose equipment costs are nozzles, fire hose, and various loose equipment. So Sid and Martin's was 542 444 Hall Ferrera, the base price was 
uh, Lone Star E1, the base price was 697485 and the added loose equipment is 44556 I think you're taking care of me over there, aren't you, because I forgot to click. Thank you. So the financial impact on Sid and Martin Emergency Group best value was 589000 and in collaboration with Finance and Fleet Services, the financing is appropriated in the account number that you see on the screen. And staff recommends that the city manager be authorized to execute the purchase of a fire engine through HGAC cooperative contract from Sid and Martin's emergency group, and that the city manager or designee is expressly, author expressly authorized to execute any all change orders with the amount set by state and local law. And I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Mr. Oakery. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Chief, do I, would they be putting this? I know with fire station number nine in the engine there, almost remind me of a nursery rhyme, but it, but it did with a train. But uh, that will they will, will they uh, will they ship this uh, this engine to the buy board, or will they come directly to us, or how does that work? Okay, so what we do is purchase it through the buy board. Once we do that, we're a placeholder in line in the factory, and the factory will <coughs> wherever we stand in line will begin to build the fire truck. <coughs> we will go to the factory to do an inspection on the truck prior to the completion of the truck to make sure that all the specifications are correct. Once they are correct, we do a final inspection. That will come back to the dealer. Uh, I think the dealer is in Houston, I believe. They have another place in Dallas. I don't know which place it will go to, either Dallas or Houston. We'll do the final inspection on the fire truck, and then we will <coughs> have them deliver the fire truck to Killeen, probably from Houston or Dallas. The actual plant that's building the fire truck is in Wisconsin. It's uh, Appleton, Wisconsin is the, is the town. Is that the same uh, place or the plant? Because you show pictures uh, the one, the engine in uh, Fire Station 9, we were putting it together with that, the chassis and everything. So that one was built in South Dakota. Okay. So this, this is a different company. Okay. Uh, we did some price comparisons to try to do a little bit better on our budgeting so that we would come up with a, with a good, safe fire engine that would accomplish our mission for a much better price. All right. Thank you. Mrs. Fleming. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Chief, I think this is a fantastic idea that you are coming up with getting an engine. After the purchase of this engine, how long exactly will it take to get everything complete? Usually it's about a year. A we're year? Ho we're hoping we can speed that process up. We could compress it down to nine months, but most of the time it's about a year to build a fire engine. Okay, thank you. Mr. Harris. Uh, first thing I want to say, I'm, I'm glad we're getting another fire engine. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I guess the question I have now is um, because we originally had the analysis plan, and y'all, like you said, you did an assessment and determined that we needed to get a fire engine uh, instead as far as a higher priority. So I guess the question now is um, on a scale, I guess on a scale of one to five, as far as the two analysts that we were going to purchase on a scale of one to five, uh, what is our level of need for those as well? Because I know they were, if they were put on there, that means there must have been some need, but this, this of course, uh, over, overrode the need for those, but what, on a scale of one to five, what's our, what's our need for those two ambulances? So we always need fire engines and ambulances because if you look at our, at our, our fleet of ambulances, we need to ro rotate them about every three years. Okay. So if we have nine ambulances, right now we're running eight, but let's just use nine, you'd have to buy about three, about three per year to keep up with that. So on a one to five scale, your ambulance need is a two or three. On the one to five scale right now, your engine need is highest, the, the numbers four and five being the, a greater need. Right, right. It's okay. a four or five for a fire engine. So we need ambulances as well. We, of course, are trying to make the most out of the money that's available within the Exactly, economy. exactly. Yes, we'll, we'll work on that next year with fleet services. And actually, that's, that's what I was going to ask. I was going to say, what is our feasibility of actually um, getting those ambulances put onto the uh, budget for next year? It's actually very good because, you know, we're we're budgeting a fixed amount in our general fund now for uh, fleet replacements. So I, I hesitate to say it's absolute, but it's pretty close. Okay, good, good. Okay, thank you. Mr. Herrera. I kind of dare to say that you call for service on those ambulances almost double by now per year. Call for service goes up every year. But I got a feeling that call for service now has been the highest maybe you've seen in the history of Colleen. I think our calls now are approaching 25, 26,000 a year. Now that's everything. That, that's all types of calls that we have. So minor calls, major calls, but they are occupying. My, my other question is, uh, in those call for service that we get in the city, 
Uh, the, were there any time that we had to go to privatize uh, private company to be able to do those call for service because we couldn't do it? There are a lot of times when we use mutual aid <clears throat> or automatic aid, they come across. Harker Heights comes and helps. Um, Fort Hood has come and help. Is that getting to be a? Is that, get, is that getting to be a uh, something that we're doing kind of often lately? Well, what we do is we have what's called um, zero level on ambulances. So when the ambulances get down to one that's available in service, we basically make a call out. The battalion chief makes a call out, and he has them expedite so that we can get another unit back in service. So we don't do it. We don't ask for mutual aid very often, but yes, it could happen at any point during the day. Our levels of ambulances that get down to one or zero is several times a week. Uh, we do the best that we can to try to rotate. Well, oh, I understand you all try to do the best as quickly oh, yeah, as we possibly right. can. But at any time, depending on what the individual calls could be, any time during the day, um, we could possibly have a mutual. Lately, I'm being very, situation. very concerned about the call for service and those ambulances out there, and giving privatized company to come in and, and, and give us a hand. And I know that costs a lot of money to the city as well. So I'm, I'm, I got a feeling we do need those ambulances. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, anybody else? Mr. Johnson. There was a fire engine that burnt up a while ago, and I, I think the city got a payout insurance from TML around 400000 Is that allocated, or, or we, is, this, is it just sitting in general, general no, fund? No, that, that money was uh, allocated in the general fund as part of the <laughs> overall general fund appropriation. Um, the amount that we got back actually covers this fire engine. Perfect. Um, so it's... Uh, if you're doing a, an assessment on the amount we got paid from insurance versus what this fire engine costs, the insurance covers this fire engine. Okay. And it, so it was put back in the fire department, not just general fund. Okay. Who was it? It was, it was put into the general fund. Mm -hmm. It was put into the general fund and used when, uh, when the city was feeling a lot of that financial stress that you all dealt with a couple of years ago. And so this, this fire engine is being paid for out of the equipment replacement allocation we make every year. And I don't know how you want to look at that, but that's, that's basically how it worked. That's good. Mr. Harris. So the, so the money put back, when the money was put back in the general fund, it wasn't used to build fire station number nine? No, it wasn't okay. used for that purpose. Thank you. That's bomb that money. That was bomb money. allocated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry. No, I was going to say that's our last of that bomb money we had when we built that fire station. It wasn't this, so. Because I heard that somewhere, but I'm just, yeah. I was curious. No, that's not true. That money was previously allocated for the fire, I mean, yeah. for the fire station. Uh -huh. All right. Anybody else? No? Moving on to public hearing. Thank you, Chief. PH 18-006, hold the public hearing and consider an ordinance requested by WLW Enterprise, LLC case number Z18-03, to rezone lot 13, block 2, levy commercial First Amendment from B5 Business District to R3 Multifamily Residential District to R2 Two-Family Residential Districts in lots number 14 through 19, Block 2, Levy Commercial First Amendment from B5 to Business District to R2 Two-Family Residential District. Man, there's a lot in there, Mr. McElwain. The properties are addressed as 302, 304, 306, 308, 310, 312, and 400. Lowe's Boulevard. Mr. McElwain, that was a mouthful. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council. As the Mayor mentioned, uh, the properties in question are an existing subdivision uh, that was platted in conjunction with the extension of Lowe's Boulevard. These lots are located along the south right away of Lowe's Boulevard. And it happens that these properties have a current zoning <coughs> of uh, B5 and R3, but they abut against an existing single family neighborhood. <clears throat> so on this map graphic, you'll see a light blue ring. That's our 200 foot notification boundary. Within that ring is a bold shape uh, for these lots here. These are the lots in question. This is the area in question. Uh, this uh, is a holdover of the old R3 zoning district that is on part of this lot and everything as you head east is zone B5, but you'll see uh, along Brook Hollow and Brookway, 
Uh, these all existing single family homes. Now, this area is designated for a general commercial use, but in our conversations with the developer, it's such a small area, and we actually happen to have residential within this general commercial area. Uh, we were not uh, in a position to feel comfortable with moving forward with the Flume Amendment. We just didn't think it was necessary. It's a very small area. We notified 33 surrounding property owners. Uh, we received the response of support from Mr. Bruce White as he is the applicant, but he also owns the adjacent property, a portion of it within a 200-foot notification boundary. At our Planning and Zoning Commission meeting that we had, uh, Mr. Eats, Ms. Jackson, and Mr. Bennett were present, and they voiced concerns about flooding in the area. This is an existing condition, particularly downstream. And also there was a conversation in the suit about whether or not these structures would be two-story. Uh, that's a building code zoning requirement. If someone wants to build a two-story home, they could, but uh, uh, they were concerned about privacy. After due consideration of those comments and also uh, the recommendation of the city staff, the Planning and Zoning Commission is recommending approval of R2 zoning for these properties, and I'll go back to the map graphic. It's only for these properties right here. This is R3, and you can put single family, two family, or above in that zoning district. As you can see, council, they're pretty much shaped the same as the single family lots. The developer's intent is to market it. Uh, if they get a builder for single family homes, they'll build single family homes. If they get a builder for duplexes, they'll build duplexes. They may mix it. We're not, we're not sure, but they absolutely didn't want commercial right against these houses here, and we agree that wasn't a, a, good, uh, a good thing to have in that community. So I'd like to answer any questions you have uh, regarding this, and uh, I'm available for anything you may want to have answered. Questions, Ms. Fleming. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. McElwain, I have talked to one, of the, one out of the three people yes. that voiced their concern about the flooding and has there been a survey to see if there's, there won't be flooding in that area? We receive as part of any type of development proposal uh, elevation certificates of something that is a floodplain. Uh, we participate uh, in the uh, uh, National Flood Insurance Program. So we do have maps that show floodplain areas here. Uh, I don't have a map graphic of it, but what you'll typically see, uh, Ms. Fleming, is we have a situation where Brookway Drive actually acts as a conveyance point for a lot of flooding in this area. Okay. So any development that occurs here will have to account for that uh, at the time they come in to pull a permit. So if they're not in the floodplain, by the way, but they're if not. you are okay. developing- you mean Ms. I talked to Ms. Jackson. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that we require is that you can't create a rise in downstream community if you build. So there's a bit of analysis that we go through. So uh, Ms. Jackson did voice concerns. Um, the situation is that neighborhood has been flooding for a while. Their concern is that they think further development will exacerbate and make that situation worse. Uh, we feel comfortable that we can account for any floodplain issues from this development quite easily. We actually accounted for a lot of that when we did the uh, capital improvement project for the Stingula Lowe's Boulevard. Uh, it was part of the Tremere Road CIP, pro uh, CIP program. So the city accounted for uh, the development potential based on the existing commercial development here. So if they down zone it, what we're looking at is less impervious cover and uh, should be easier to accommodate those structures versus all impervious bigger areas where you would have commercial developments, uh, less opportunity for flood waters to seep into the ground. So all that you're saying, everything is okay? For this project, yes, but we do admit that if okay. you're familiar with this area, mm -hmm. Uh, we have a well, one year event, it, it floods. Mm -hmm. Okay, but she's real excited about it and she's not far there, so I don't know what's going to happen, but thank you, Tony. And she's, thank, 
more than welcome to come to see us. I, I didn't get a chance to talk to her, but our door is open if she has. Okay, because I talked to her in depth today, so she's really concerned about this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Harris. Um, this question just came to mind as uh, Councilwoman, Councilwoman Fleming was speaking. Uh, the area that they want to build in, is that um, all grassy area right now, just pretty much so? It is. Uh, yes. Okay, so um, so I can understand a citizen's concern when they say they're going to build over there because, of course, that's going to add more concrete. And that's going to leave less, um, less land for the uh, water to be absorbed into and so forth. Um, so you said that, uh, I guess, I guess the, you know, the city has a, well, there's a, there's a plan as far as diverting that water because, like I said, when the concrete comes, that's going to be more water um, going somewhere else. So what is, what is our plan um, as far as being able to divert that water to keep that area from flooding even more since it's going to be pretty much adjacent to it? At the same time, you know, I guess I have to ask the question, whose responsibility is it going to be to take care of uh, providing that drainage, if you will, sure. to an area that will be sufficient to minimize the, the extra water that may come into that neighborhood? Sure. Anytime we have a development in a city, it is the responsibility of the developer slash builder to handle uh, the runoff from their site. Now, we review it and we make sure it's in accordance with the drainage design manual. In this particular case, uh, what Mr. Whitus has decided to do is to basically do a waiver of runoff liability. And what that means is he's going to discharge the water from one lot to another lot onto his own property. So what that means is that if you are the future builder of this property, eventually you're going to get to a location where you're going to have a lot that you're going to have to really accommodate the runoff from. Now, that document is something that gets recorded. We keep it on file. We present it to anyone who comes in for a permit. So uh, essentially what you typically have is they'll, they'll grade the pad side up, and they'll divert the runoff into a certain direction. We don't allow you to divert more than two lots onto one other lot. And then you'll see a series of drainage easements that will convey some of the runoff to the street eventually. Uh, some of it will convey to um, some of the means if there's a common drainage feature that may be in a subdivision. Uh, for this small of an area, we're not anticipating any problems at all. Uh, actually, I will probably tell you the, the, um, the uh, Lowe's Boulevard project itself was probably the lion's worth of the work with regard to the drainage. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> so is, is from y'all's evaluation, the size of the, size of the, uh, the lot that he's going to leave to take the water in, is that going to be adequate enough? Uh, yes. Do you, do you think? We, we think so. Okay. We so, absolutely feel comfortable. So there's that. not going to be any significant runoff into any streets or, I mean, once it's in the lot, I mean, so like if there's a heavy rain, it's not going to be any uh, excessive runoff to, to the streets or anything like that to add, add water onto the streets or anything or well, I mean, in a normal rain I'll say that well yeah. I was gonna just say that yeah. if you have a typical rain situation we're fine but uh, this area sees just a lot of water mm -hmm. I mean historically uh, I talked to a resident and he's been a long time uh, resident there uh, even when they were building uh, he, he made mention that it was a spring in this area and so it is a area that is even in the driest of times still prone to moisture uh, what you do have to account for is that standards were different at the time that the subdivision back here was built. Right. And you've got this existing condition with just a, a pretty good discharge of water. Uh, I, I'm familiar with that area, and it's, uh, it's something we keep an eye on, uh, but it's something that if the city's involved, it becomes <clears throat> another drainage project that Mr. Olson's team will do. And we'll also monitor this the same way with Mr. Olson's group. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Kilpatrick. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'd, I'd like to reassure the council also that, you know, that being in my district, we have a lot of uh, a lot of concerns in this in this area. For we have multiple underground springs. Uh, Thirty-three uh, years ago, when I put in. A swimming pool. We dug the hole, and the the pool itself flew out of the ground because water underground spouts started coming up. Uh, so we have we do have, but uh, I will assure that the, what they've done with those Boulevard will alleviate that, and to assure the council uh, as a B5 what it is right now, the uh, the developer could put a uh, a 20-store strip mall in there 
with all parking lot and all cement and uh, no grass permeation to, to go into it without it ever coming to this board or this council uh, or anything but platting. Uh, so I've spoken to about eight of the residents around there and they're, um, while, while they'll always express concern about uh, any type of flooding, it's gonna be developed. And whether it's developed commercial with uh, uh, a lot of cement or with um, residential with lesser amount uh, where we can do ground permeation. And you can also run off into retention, as I said, and the waiver will more than account for dumping it onto the developer's last property. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is Nash King. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a concern. Um, I agree with Mr. Harris and Mrs. Sherman about Ms. Jackson. We know that there is a problem, and I know it's been a while, the building codes have changed. Why are we not addressing that issue if we already know a wait until it gets worse than what it is? You have a couple of different and I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question so that we're not getting outside of the vein of the zoning case, but as it relates to land use, the fear is that any more development will basically make a situation worse. Uh, each, each dynamic in somebody's yard is a little different. Some people may have standing water for a while, depending on the topography of the ground, and some people may be at the low end of a subdivision. Uh, some people have added more in, impervious surface to their yard. Uh, a lot of what we see with regard to drainage is complaint driven, <coughs> but it's dynamic in the sense that when it rains, you get calls. When it's dry, you typically get fewer. Uh, with Ms. Jackson, I'm not familiar if she's made her concerns known to anyone on the staff prior to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. But um, if, if it is something that um, warrants a visit from the city staff. Ms. Ramirez's group is available to do that because it may be a situation that is unique to her property that warrants some further consideration. But uh, for this particular zoning case, in terms of just land use, as Mr. Kilpatrick mentioned, you've got the ability to put in commercial now. And that typically will have far less green space and while we can still account for the drainage, from a land use compatibility standpoint, it's probably not desirable. And when you add that to their concerns about flooding, you may have a dynamic there where it just becomes untenable for them to live there. So we're trying to, to mitigate the land use by down zoning with your consideration. And then if you have a citizen and you think that they have concerns, direct them our way. We will certainly meet with them. We'll go on their property and we'll do what we can to help them. All right, anybody else? Ms. Fleming. Mr. Yeah. I'll call Ms. Jackson to see if she would like to meet with you sure. with her concerns and everything. Thank you, sir. Okay. I'll call her tonight. All right, well, thank you, Mr. McElwain. Moving now on to DS 18-033, discuss citizens' donation to the Senior Citizens Utility Build Assistant Program, Animal Services, and the Youth Summer Program. Mr. Baldwin. 32, Mr. Mayor. O32. Did I miss some? Did we discuss O32? 32. I don't have a 32. Yes. That yes, was, we have a 32. That was the discussion of the agenda, right? Oh, yeah, that's the agenda. No, we're good. Your slides says okay. <coughs> <clears throat> We're on 32 now. I know some people are using, some of the council members are using electronic version. Does anyone need a, a copy version of the proposed policy? I don't, I don't have anything at all. Okay. Yeah, I don't have any. Anybody else? Hang on there. It's actually 033. It's 033? This on the, one's on the agenda online. Presentation? Okay. So this for oh, online? Yeah. Presentation on the agenda online. It's 033. It's got a link under there, yeah. Misnumbered. I apologize for that. Hmm. Mayor, City Council, tonight is a proposal for a policy for utility bill monetary donations. 
and we'll cover three different programs. We'll get into those a little bit more after we discuss the basis of the policy. The policy will establish, if approved by you, the, it, the process that will be followed for donations received through the utility bills. It identifies programs to be included in the utility bills. It states the purpose of the program. It explains the application process and eligibility determination and states the public purpose served by the program. Donations received will be deposited in the accounts designated for the donated purpose. The first program is one you may be familiar with. It's the Senior Citizen Utility Bill Assistance Program. The purpose of this program is to provide financial assistance for senior citizens on their utility bills. The application is submitted to the Director of Finance. Eligible senior citizens must be at least <coughs> 60 years of age. They may apply, uh, and if they're accepted on the program, they can remain on for six months. Afterwards, they have to wait six months before they can reapply. The public purpose served is to reduce the impact on community resources by providing assistance to senior citizens who are unable to pay their utility bill. This next one's a newer one. It's a summer youth program. The purpose of this program is to provide financial assistance for children unable to attend city-based, <coughs> city fee-based summer programs. An application submitted is submitted to the Director of Community Services from February 1st through April 15th for the following summer. To be eligible, families must be at or below 80% of the area's median household income. For example, an annual household income of a four-person household must be at or below 47,750. Eligible children must live in the city of Killeen and be between the ages of four and 16. Each child may receive a discount up to $100 towards the cost of the program or programs with a 200 uh, maximum discount per family per summer. So there's really no money exchange in hands, it's just a discount that's applied. The public purpose served is to reduce the impact on community resources by providing services to children who are unable to attend city fee-based summer programs. The next program is Animal <laughs> Services Unit. The purpose of the program is to provide additional resources for animals in the care of the Animal Services Unit. The Chief of Police will manage the donations received. Funds will be used to provide spay and neuter services for animals in the care of the Animal Services Unit. The public purpose served is to reduce the impact on community resources by providing spay and neuter services for animals in the care of Animal Services Unit. I have one question, Mr. Mayor. This is Fleming. One question, Mr. Baldwin. Yes, ma'am. Uh, what it says about the uh, animal shelter can only be used for spayed and neutered services. Wouldn't that be tying the hands of the new director? Because if he's not able to go further than just spayed and neutered, it may be something else that the animals may need in that shelter. So if you're only going to specify one thing, to me the funds are going, you're going to tie up the funds under one thing. So. I think that needs to be revised right there, sir. And what we'll do is we'll take these suggestions and flesh them out and try to come back with some different options uh, <coughs> next week. I would say that spay and neutering is one of the most expensive side of the house when it comes to animal services. Yes, sir. Moreover, uh, there's other programs out there, funds, both budgeted and otherwise, that cover some of those other expenses. That said, we'll definitely include it in here as a you recommendation. You kind of look through that and make sure you could kind of add something else to that because it's like just one thing. And I know spade and neuter is very important because I think that's a very important thing. When you adopt an animal, they should be spayed and neutered before they leave the shelter. That's one thing I was talking about mm -hmm. to Mr. Uh, the other director when he was there. But yes, I think we need to broaden this out, sir, if you could possibly do that. Maybe create a clause that allows some discretion, yes. and that way, because where would the list end if we don't? So we'll find some type of generic clause. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I have Mrs. Nash King. Yes, I'm finished now. I have a question about the, uh, and I commend you on the policy for you, but we do need uh, ways to pay for low income family members to attend events in the city. But the 80%, where did you get the 80% from? this apply for each individual child in the house? It's based on the family household income. I believe it's based off the communities and schools. Is that what the form was used? I'm going to ask Brett to highlight that. He's the one that tracked down that number for us. <coughs> Mr. 
Welcome, Mr. Williams. Sir, it's the same guidelines that are used for CDBG. It's the average, 80% of the average median income of our area. And will each youth be able to apply for this grant or this service? The whole household of five, five kids, each individual will be able to apply for it? It's based on the, it's a, it's a sliding scale based on the number of family members, but it's not, there could be three kids and one adult. And so it won't be a limited, limited to two kids, but it will be $200 per household. That'll be the maximum. So now if there are, if there are three kids and there's two programs and they're $50 per program, we're going to spike out at $100 per kid or $200 for the household. If that's one kid got $100 and the other got, the other two got $50, that would be the maximum would be the $200. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Brett. This is an example of the utility bill. If you look to the right portion of this screenshot, you'll see where it's been added to where someone who wants to donate funds for any one of these three programs, they have the opportunity to do so. If they want to specify a program, they have that opportunity as well. Uh, we do have a program where if for some reason a customer would like to have, let's say, $20 added on to their bill on a monthly basis. There's a paperwork that the utility collection department would need to have filled out, and they can automatically bill that extra $20 on their monthly bill uh, so they can continuously give for a particular cause. Do we need to go down there and pick the paperwork up? on this, so how do we do that? I, I think it depends on the customer because some customers may not have access to internet, some probably do, so I would suggest anybody that, that does not have that email uh, internet capability to notify uh, utility collections either by mail, they can notify the city manager's office, what have you, and we'll facilitate that outcome. Next step is request City Council to consider placing the policy for management on monetary donations through the utility bills on a future agenda for consideration. Can you, uh, how much on the average do we receive from that? And is there a, any particular one that gets more that the citizens put on there? Well, the summer program doesn't exist yet. This is just now starting. The animal services, I don't have that information. I but thought, that's I thought separate. on the bills there was a check mark. Was, there's not right now. On the, on, for, they can do it for the senior utility Seniors. bills. That one there, I, is it 20,000? <laughs> is that the number, generally speaking? Leslie, do you know? I don't have the exact number, sir. I've heard that number floated around, but we'll find out and get that back to City Council. Mr. Johnson. Is, uh, is there a way to have just a small printout that we can um, place at several of the uh, high traffic city owned facilities like the senior centers and the Community centers and print out of the just a the, the, the sample bill. Yeah, or, just I mean, just something that's real small that that a can, little flyers. What you're looking yeah, for? Yeah, just something okay. that we can, we can get something out. made up. Videos. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anybody else? We would need to wait until it's adopted, of course, before we can do something like that. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. You're not done. I thought I'm you're done. done. Sir. <laughs> you're Thank done. Thank you very much. I am. <laughs> All right. And before we adjourn, I just have one question. Uh, we were talking, getting back to that item on solid waste, we were talking about doing a meeting next week. So are we going to do a special council meeting next week? Is that where we're heading? So everybody, just kind of give everybody an idea. And we want to do that after our regular council meeting. So kind of plan ahead. So next week is a special council meeting just for that one item there. So... With that, that was our last item, so... Move to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. I heard a second. All those in favor, just say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Thank you.